We love you. We care for you in the Lord. We're very excited to be congregated in this morning or this afternoon or is this evening or early morning in the different places worldwide where the Church of the Lord may be, the different continents. And it is exciting to have our the life God gave us, the, for God to give us health for God to give us this opportunity, truly. First, to be before the living God, the God who manifests himself in spirit and truth. Glory to the Lord. And second, that he allowed us to know his path, to be under his shelter, under his protection, endless love under his salvation in this wonderful gospel. And third, for him to have given us this life and our health, our this opportunity, this wonderful opportunity, to be able to praise to him, to sing to his name, to read the Bible, to enjoy the sermon at this time from our sister Maria Luisa. This is the greatest blessing in life and we give thanks to God for, for it. Because of that, we are going to offer this service and we're going to dedicate it to him with all our heart. And we're going to ask him and tell him we love him and that we thank him and that our lives are for him and by the Lord, and that our lives are different in him, that we don't have words, but nothing for nothing but greatness for his kindness and blessings and wonderful blessings with which he has given us happiness. Even if there are hardships and adversities, we are with the Lord, and we know that always, we will always come out on top. Glory to God. Blessed Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. Truly, Lord, for this wonderful moment, because it is not little, but too much. It is great to know that we are before the living God, to know that we are before the Creator, to know that we are before He who gave us life, before He who has protected our existence and has been attentive to our requests and supplications attentive to protect us and to help us and to give us so much triumph and so many blessings in life. Thank you, Lord, for being so generous. Thank you, Lord, for extending your kindness to our lives. Thank you for being so close to us. Thank you for all your blessings that are spiritually first of all, material as well, and in, of all kind in our existence. Lord, we don't have ways to repay you. Our lives are short to be able to pay you back for the great goodness of your favors and your mercy, your manifestation, Lord, in our lives, to bless us, to help us, to give us victory, to give us triumph and blessings. And that's why, Lord, we are going to sing to your name hymns, choruses with all our hearts, and we're going to be happy in you because the glory and honor belongs to you and we live to praise you. That's why our existence are for, to thank you. There is a song of thanksgiving in our hearts. There are songs of praises, Lord. And also, we are going to partake of the beautiful sermon through our sister Maria Luisa. Lord of glory, thank you for our sister and thank you for all the blessings that which you give us through the preaching of the gospel, through the teaching of your word that you that your servant, your apostle and prophetess imparts to us. Thank you, Lord. And also, God, because all of us are congregated at this time, enjoying your love, enjoying all of us as one man and many people who are first time guests, too, for whom we ask that you give us many blessings upon their lives in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to God. We are going to read in our Bibles in the book of Philippians. Let us read chapter number four, starting with verse number four. Let us read for the glory and honor and exaltation of the Lord. And rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. We're reading Philippians 4, verse 6. 
But in pr everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made to know known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Glory to God. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. That's what we say today with our teacher, our sister Maria Luisa. And the God of peace will be with you. Glory to the Lord. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that, I, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to, be, to abound everywhere. And in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. Blessed is the name of the Lord. This is what we say as well. Glory to God. You may take your seats, brothers and sisters, and we're going to be singing hymns to exalt our God and especially hymn 1, 214 titled, I Am Not Alone, with the conviction that our lives are so, that we are not alone. Glory to the Lord. May, that God is with us and if God is with us, we have everything in life. Glory to the Lord. We know that God will always give us a way out. We know that God will never allow us to be abandoned. We know that something good and better is on our way for our existence. Glory to the Lord. 2.14 beautiful it is to sing to our God. I believe we all enjoy it endlessly because it is to praise God and God also is also happy with us when we sing to him, when we praise him. And he is even happier in as much as we strive every day to seek his presence. Glory to the Lord. May God see that effort in us, that love to God and those songs. That is the perfect domination, the beautiful way 
a complete way to be able to come to his heart. Let us sing another hymn, hymn number 231, that talks about the same topic. All alone? No, we're not alone. Glory to God. We have our God, the living God, who hears us, who is by our side, who makes us promises through the gift of prophecy. He guides us in visions and dreams. Glory to God. 231. Blessed is the name of the Lord. It is likely that many of you at this time are in need, financial need, or an, of any kind, that you may also be in countries or places where the church is not open or you don't or you have a hard time getting to our locations or you may be feeling alone. But the truth is, having the live streams and the internet Knowing that in the internet, we will also we also have the recordings from the sermons of Francis Mary Louise of the Bible studies on the on the website of the church, idmjiorg en for English. It is a great blessing, and God has taught us that through that material that is there in the website of the church as well as the YouTube channels, people who tune in and watch those messages are going to be blessed. We have heard many, many testimonies as to how, how during the prayer of our sister Mary Lisa, people have been healed. God has worked great miracles and the way God has blessed people materially. And so truly the, the solution is at hand. So you shouldn't be bitter because a lot of times you try to help people, but you have a way to humanly do so. But the solution is there. It is just a matter of telling them, go in. Go to the website of the church and you will find a lot of material of the church, but also go to the YouTube channel. Right now, you are going to see a tutorial as to how you can you subscribe. So you have, we have two YouTube channels. You will go to the YouTube channel and then you'll be able to look for it. For, look for the church with the initials of the church. C, Church of God, Ministry of Jesus Christ International. So C, G, M, I, 
C I official. That's in the YouTube channel for the church. And then for our sister Maria Luisa, you have Maria Luisa Pirakive official. So you can go to both channels. You subscribe. Also, you will hit like on the live streams. That way you help us so that many more people will be receive a benefit and will know the more because the more likes a live stream has or each channel has, then the more people will uh, be interested in going into it and the more benefits there will be. And also you where you see a little bell, then you will be able to customize your notifications so that you get all of them. So to, to be notified every time there's something new. I'm going to give you an example. There's a, a person who owns land and he has fruit trees and he also owns animals. It's a farm of sorts. But he said that during the pandemic, there was a time where it was really difficult. The situation turned really difficult and there was no production. And so the trees were not produ producing the animals were in either, and he was suffering quite a lot. And he called a family member of his and he said, my situation is chaotic. And so she tried to send him money to transfer money to him, but he, she wasn't able to do it. So she told him, look, the only thing I have is a great treasure. Go to the YouTube channels of the church and... Just with listening to Sister Mary Luisa, her sermons, her, the prayers from her sister, God will bless you. And he believed. He said that he started to watch the live streams and that very quickly he began to see the way the tree started to bear fruits. And that the chickens were producing one egg a week. And then in one week he, he had 15 eggs. So that is the work of God. So it is very simple. It's just a matter of practice evangelizing people that way you have your sake whatever it may be tell them go to the youtube channels and you will find the solution glory to god very well let us rise and we're going to pray to our lord but aside from praying to him we're going to thank him for all his blessings and we're also going to thank him for the fact that that the situation of the pandemic is getting better now we're able to congregate we're able to be together god has had mercy on humankind and he has had mercy on us because we were prayed to the Lord a great deal because we really met the congregation. Isn't this right? And the Lord it allows us to congregate now. It's just that we have now the live streams, which is a great treasure we now have. We didn't have that before. Now we do. Glory to God. And we are going to thank the Lord also for all the blessings with which he has given in our live abundance and he has helped us financially and he has supported us in everything and that's also why we give offerings and tithe with all our hearts glory to god blessed lord we give you thanks for listening to the prayers so that we were able to overcome this pandemic in good measure for everything to make good progress that we're moving forward out of all this chaos in humankind. And now, Lord, we are able to congregate. For us, that's truly beautiful. The congregation is wonderful. Thank you, Lord, because you've also provided for our financial life, our work lives. You have given us opportunities at work to make to have income and we and our families have not lacked anything. And you have been with us, helping us very much, and also the church. Oh God, you have helped the church so that the evangelizing work continues because the church remained in spite of this great tribulation. The church continues to be present and throughout the world in so many countries, Lord, around the world. The church is carried on, strengthened by your hand, with your help. That's why we, O oh Lord, have no way to tell you our gratitude. Words are never enough, Lord, but in our hearts we have a huge gratitude. Thank you for these live streams. Thank you for the miracles that you perform, Lord, through the sermons, through the prayer, the videos. When people watch them with love, with faith, when people sit down to do this with 
their willingness and you are working great miracles and making the church known in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to God. And we are going to sing chorus number 27. I have a living God. Number 27. Blessed is the name of the Lord. How wonderful. We're so excited to feel the presence of our God so close to our lives. The living God. Glory to the Lord. And let us sing chorus 12, the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And who among you believes this? Glory to the Lord. Let us raise our hand, those of us who believe this to be true. Glory to God. It is our great strength. Blessed is the Lord. Number 12. is the Lord. Imagine something, brothers and sisters. A few days ago, a brother showed up because he didn't have a job, so he applied to a position that was open at a company, and there were 500 people pre-selected initially, then 70. Then he saw that they were asking for so many requirements that they didn't call him back, so he said, nope, I'm not going to call that company because they didn't call me for that position so and he had a dream where he saw sister Mary Louise and sister Mary Louise and the dream told him 
prepare your documents. But it was a very long list of documents. And he said, okay, I'm going to obey that. I'm going to obey the dream. He completed all the, do all the documents. He got called a few days ago. They called all 70 of them and they told everyone, whoever has the documents ready tomorrow, that's the person who will be hired. And he was the only one who had them ready. Well, glory to the Lord, our sister Mary Louisa in the dream. And here with us, our sister Mary Louisa with us, our beautiful sister with us, will continue with her. We'll let us continue with a big round of applause because we love her. We admire her with all our heart. Dios los bendiga a todos. Sí. Señor les bendiga. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. And those newcomers and first-time guests, a very warm welcome to all of you. And I always say that I serve the Lord in dreams because in reality, it is so difficult. It is so difficult. And in dreams, that is so beautiful. And either way, the Lord knows how to work and how to do his wonderful, marvelous work so that this church may grow and prosper and have progress and that it could be as the Lord said so over 50 years ago. The Lord spoke this and he made that promise and he made a commitment that he would be the one to bring people to his congregation. And look at what the Lord uses to bring people to the church. He gives them dreams. He gives them dreams. And there are people or people have some sayings where they say that dreaming doesn't cost a thing. And well, for the Lord, a dream is very important and it's of great value. And Truly, God has made his church grow through dreams and through visions. And the dreams have been wonderful. And it's been now over 50 years, people sharing their dreams and the way that God speaks to them and teaches them, guides them, leads them and blesses them. And we give the Lord thanks. Thanks because those dreams that those in antiquity had, those ancestors that Jacob and the dreams of those people in antiquity, we sort of were a bit envious of those dreams. But no, we're not envious of that anymore because it is the same God of yesterday and it's the same God of that time. That God of today is the same. He is the same. So he manifests himself and he behaves the same way with us. And we thank the Lord we give thanks to our God for that. Thanks be to the Lord. And how beautiful it is that the world could know that God exists, that God is real, that God is love, that God is mercy, and that the world may open their heart for him, to please him and to serve him. I think that we would live in paradise if that was the case, but here we are, of course, in this fight, and God has set us here as workers in his vineyard, as his laborers. That is what God has appointed us for, so that we may win over souls for the kingdom of heaven. And each of us, each of you, are winning a soul. You win a soul with your testimony, with your good example, with the way that you live your life. And you say, I go to a church. I read the Bible. I love God. With that, it is enough. And that is how you evangelize and you're winning over a soul because you are bearing a good testimony and people say, yes, I believe this person has God because look at the life that they lead. It is a life of a good example, a very marvelous, wonderful life. And we, every one of us, we are winning souls for the kingdom of God in one way or another, in many different ways. There are many ways to serve the Lord. So we must continue forward. And it's not just with the gift of prophecy. It's not just with the gift of working miracles. But in many ways, like I said, with your testimony, you are winning souls for God. And so you may be seated. You can get comfortable. And we are going to be singing to our God a hymn. And I also greet all the churches in the United States and all of those who today are gathered in the churches, 
I know that in Colombia, there are also many churches that brothers and sisters are congregating at and they're watching the sermon live. But also there are still some places that there actually isn't any internet uh, signal. So, of course, they have to then go on their own to watch the Bible studies on the pa- on the web page. But those who are uh, watching live in South America and North America and even in Europe, if there are brothers and sisters uh, in this moment tuned in, please know that we love you. We are thinking of all of you and we long with all of our heart that God blesses you and that God speaks to you, guides you, and for God to always be with you. And we give thanks to our God. He deserves the honor and praise. Blessed is the Lord. Let us sing hymn number 32. The King's Business. The King's Business. We are partakers in the business of our King to serve the Lord and win souls for the Lord. So let us sing with all of our heart. Soy peregrino aquí, mi hogar lejano está, en la mansión de luz, eterna paz y amor. Embajador yo soy, del reino celestial, en los negocios de mi rey. Este mensaje fiel oír que dijo ya celeste voz, reconciliaos ya, dice el Señor. Pecado vil, arrepentidos ya, han de reinar con él, los que obedientes son, es el mensaje fiel que debo más bello es que el valle de Sarón, eterno gozo y paz, reinan por siempre en él, y allí Jesús dará eterna vida. El Señor y Rey, reconciliado soy con Dios. Bendito y alabado el nombre del Señor. Blessed and praised is the name of the Lord. And reconciled to God today with our God. And we today. The brothers and sisters, they know that we need to have our Bible in 2 Corinthians ready in chapter number 4. And we continue in a sequence with um, our sermon today. 
Now, of course, if we have enough time, then perhaps we'll, we will continue with the next chapter or a part of the next chapter. But if not, I think we will stop to understand each verse and what the Apostle Paul learned from the Lord. And how the Apostle Paul, here in the previous chapters, in 1 Corinthians, he spoke and taught concerning resurrection. And I, I know that it is now clear to us all. And then in chapter 1 and 2, since they are the Apostles' experiences, personal experiences, I didn't think it was so important for us to read. But now, with chapter 3, which we went over last week, we discussed the New Covenant. And we talked about those great wonders that God has for us today and that he had in that time in antiquity with the people of Israel in that time. But in this chapter three, I'd like before to, to start with chapter four, I'd like to go back a little bit. And we are reading chapter four, second Corinthians today, but I want to clarify a bit because some newcomers, they tell me that they are newcomers, um, but either way, they've had the opportunity to go to other evangelical churches and read the Bible, and so they felt a bit confused and didn't quite understand when I said that God punished According to them, God does not punish, that God is just love, that God overlooks things, and God always blesses. That is the God that all of us would love to have. Yes, God is love. God is good. God is righteous. God is merciful and loving for those who are righteous, for those who are upright, those who obey the obedient. But those who are disobedient submit to God, for them, God becomes a God of consuming fire. He is God of wrath and of anger and of punishment. That is the God we have. Now, which God do you want to have? The God of love or the God who is consuming fire? We want to have a God of love. And when I was giving you examples of the prophet Elijah who faced 450 false prophets, and the only one who had God was Elijah. He was the only one who did God's will. The other prophets were not doing God's will. So God turned away from them. They were false prophets. And God supported Elijah. The same with a different case with the prophet Micah. When he prophesied and he said that God had revealed to this prophet that he had sent a lying spirit into the mouths of all of the false prophets so that they would deceive the king. Deceive him in such a way that it actually happened. But why did God allow this lying spirit? Because that king was evil. Those people were evil. They were idolaters. They were pagan. And aside from that, they were persecuting the people of God. And God was very angry with this king. And this is why he allowed a lying spirit in the mouths of those false prophets to prophesy beautiful things, nice things, and for him to be very confident and go off to war and lose. And there he died. And God supported the true prophet because he was doing God's will. So God does that. And today we are talking about that in the church, we have the spiritual gifts with us. And among those spiritual gifts, we have the gift of prophecy. And today, God too has given us prophets in the church. In the church, we have prophets, prophetesses, and brothers and sisters who have the gift of prophecy. But also, we have many people who come to church and have been in the church for 5, 10, 15 years or more and they are in the church and consistent as believers, but they are not doing God's will. They are sinning. They live in sin. And I said, 
And some even practice witchcraft and sorcery still, and they are in the congregation as believers, yet they practice witchcraft. And that is a sin before God. That is an abomination in the presence of the Lord. And this is why God is angry. And in becoming angry with those believers who are there and pretending, pretending that they are followers of God, pretending to be brothers and sisters of the Lord. And we, you know, we greet them. We say, brother, God bless you, sister, God bless you. And I see them in the church and I'm happy to see them because I say they're a man or a a eternal life, but I'm deceived. I'm deceived because their life actually is a life that is a bad testimony, bad example, and have not truly repented, have not converted to God. And surely maybe they only go to church because they like to listen to prophecy and they want to live an easy life. Those people, those are who I was teaching about last week, that just as the Lord placed a lying spirit in those false prophets today, the Lord can also confuse a person who is not sincere and who is in the church. And I am speaking of the people who have been in the church for quite some time. I'm not speaking about who are newcomers who are coming and first time guests because we can't demand anything from them because they are just starting this path. But those who have been in the church for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we do expect certain things. And they should be very careful because the Lord can send a lie to come and confuse them. Confuse them with their dreams and their visions and even with the prophecies. He can deceive or lie to them because they have not been sincere with God. Have not wanted to repent and live an upright life with God because 10 years is enough, 15 years is enough time for you to convert to God. So I hope that you understand me and I want to be clear. I don't want you to be confused. I don't want you to say that I'm so harsh and the message that I give are very harsh and they're punishing. No, I'm just speaking God's truth and what God teaches here in the Bible. What God teaches here in the Bible, I teach that. If I didn't teach you these truths, then I wouldn't love you. But since I love you all, I am teaching you and I'm opening your eyes to God's truth. God's truth needs to be discovered so that you may follow that path. And so the Lord today, he also can maybe place some confusion just as there's, there are people who say, well, I went to church, I received prophecy and it didn't come to pass. And I answered back and I said, well, it's because you haven't converted to God. You went to church with maybe greed, with maybe with a desire for people to maybe guess your fortune. You used prophecy as divination and that's not correct. You need to go to church to love God, please God and follow him. And if God wants to speak to us, Thanks be to the Lord, but do not seek seek prophecy or assume that it's divination because you are very mistaken. And so that could have happened. And that's why you're saying that in the prophecy, they told you things that didn't come to pass. So you must live uprightly before the Lord. Now, we're not talking, of of course, about those who are first time guests, first time guests to the church, people who are not a part of our church, have never read the Bible. They don't call themselves Christians. They're a part of a different religion and they come to the church for the first time. God speaks to them. God does not observe their current condition. If you are the biggest sinner in the world, God does not observe that. He has mercy and God says, well, This person, I'm going to speak the truth to them. I'm going to tell them things as they are so that they convert, so that they may know and understand that there is a supreme being that exists here who knows all things. And this is why I'm going to speak the truth to this person because I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to convince them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to cleanse them because if they want, I will cleanse them and deliver them and I will make of him a new man or a new woman. That is what the Lord does. So people who come to the church for the first time are greatly privileged and they are taken care of by the Lord because the Lord treats them in a very beautiful way. 
He treats these newcomers in such a beautiful way and God gives them a time. He gives them certain, a certain time when people come to the church, God gives them a certain time frame and says, I'll give this person a certain amount of time to change and to get to know me and to mature and to understand the doctrine and start to change. That is what our God does. But I think now humanly, of course, a person who has been in the church 10, 15, 20 years, I think it's already time for this person to have changed. And if they continue on in their same sin, well, I think it is God who will then make the decision of how he's going to treat these people. So that's why there are so many things that do happen in our daily lives. And sometimes people say, well, God doesn't listen to me. I pray and God doesn't listen. He doesn't hear me. Well, it's, it's that. You're not living uprightly before God, and that's why he's not listening. I'm not living uprightly before God, and this is why he's not giving me the spiritual gifts. I'm not baptized with his Holy Spirit yet. This is why he has not heard my petitions. This is why when I lay on hands, I don't see that anything happens because I'm not living uprightly before God. No, I need to set my life in order in order to receive God's support. And my dear brothers and sisters, this was for those who are well established in the church. That message was for them. I spoke of these things. It was not for the newcomers. The newcomers, do not worry. Continue forward. You are just a newborn child before the Lord, and God treats you like that. He treats you with great delicacy and gentleness. And so now let's continue in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's, it's a continuation of chapter 3. It's a continuation here. And now, what did we go over? Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul said that they were ministers, the apostles were ministers of a new covenant. Now, that first covenant, the former covenant that God had formed with Moses on Mount Sinai, and he gave him the tablets of the law written on stone. That was the first covenant. And this new covenant that the Lord formed with our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, the new covenant saying that with the shedding of his blood, there comes a new covenant, good tidings of salvation. And it is the new method of salvation, those who are newcomers and the way in which God will save people from here on out. That already happened, and it happened over 2,000 years ago. And now from 2,000 years till now, we have been preaching this gospel. And the Holy Spirit, in one way or another, has been in the world, has been in the hearts of some. Now, he or the Lord was hidden in certain times, but today we see the Lord is once again manifesting himself in the world to show his glory. Blessed is the Lord. And so here in chapter 4, verse 1, let's remember the Apostle Paul is speaking of the ministry and the work that the Lord had appointed them to do, which was to preach the gospel and in this new covenant and the good tidings of salvation. And so in verse number one, the apostle Paul says, therefore, well, let's read in verse 18 or 17. Let's go back a little bit. Verse 17, chapter three, 17. Now the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord, our God is the spirit is the Holy spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is or wherever he manifests or wherever the spirit of the Lord dwells, there is liberty. So whether it is in the heart of a man or a woman or in the congregation or thousands of congregation, wherever the Holy Spirit is, there is liberty. Glory to the name of the Lord. But verse 18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, our being. So we see the glory of God. We see the Lord's miracles. We see God's love, God's work, but we cannot touch it. We can't touch it. And it's compared to when someone sees themselves in the mirror. They see that image and you go and you try and touch it, but no, what you, what you find is just the mirror. That's what you touch. 
but there's the image. And so that's the way in which we feel God and how we live with God and how we see him as if you were seeing it through a mirror. And so, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed. So it says, yet we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Blessed is the name of the Lord. And this is the truth. Because we come to God's knowledge, we come to this place, and God begins to transform us. He gives them knowledge and maturity. We begin to understand and comprehend. And this is why we need to read the Bible time and time and a thousand times. And so you, you, you start and then you finish and you start again because that's how you learn. With time, you learn. And the more you read, you learn more. The more you read, you understand better and you continue reading and reading. And you continue reading and you never grow tired in reading because you will always learn more and more because you are being trans. Glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So the spirit of the Lord is the one who works the miracle and does that great work in our hearts because he is the one that makes us fall in love with God, that we have faith and trust in God. Verse Chapter four, verse one, therefore, and so mentioning those things that we just read, therefore, since, you know, we are seeing God's glory through a mirror and we're transformed by his Holy Spirit, as which was to preach the good tidings of salvation and to say that the Holy Spirit is who is working the miracles in people's lives. Now, it was no longer the law of Moses. That written law in books or in scrolls or in tablets of stone, it was no longer the law of Moses that would be changing the hearts of men and women. And it was not going to transform people from glory to glory, but it would now be the Holy Spirit of God. He is the one who is with us. He was sent by the Lord. Once he ascended into the heavens, he then sent his Holy Spirit to be with us, to be with human beings. So this is why it says, therefore, since we have this ministry, this ministry is working with the Holy Spirit, using us as vessels, as instruments. We are those instruments in the hands of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit of God. We are those instruments in his hands. He uses us. He alone as spirit is not working because if he worked as spirit only alone well, then no one would ever realize that no one would ever actually appreciate and value god or truly cherish the manifestation of god and god's goodness no one would thank him for it if there is a person who is in a wheelchair who is ill and the holy spirit of the lord comes and heals them and they stand well, then that person stood up and said, oh, well, I was sick and I had been in this wheelchair for 10, 15 years. And now I stood up. I don't know who healed me. Someone healed me. Someone worked this miracle, but I don't know who. But the matter is, is I'm walking now. So there is no glory to God. There is no thanks that he is owed. Thanks, God. You worked the miracle. We must honor God. We must glorify God. So this person remains Without thanking God, this is why God did not want to manifest himself alone in spirit. This is why he said, I'm going to use human beings. I'll use human beings. That's why I created them. That's why I created them to use them for what is good so that they are happy and so that they serve me. Because God has his millions and millions of angels who serve him. But he also wanted something physical, a matter to actually serve him. And this is why God uses us as human beings, as physical matter, to do the work for one another. So he uses us. He gives me spiritual gifts so that I may work those spiritual gifts with someone else. And that person is healed, delivered, and the other person receives the Holy Spirit. And so all of us together having those spiritual gifts, having all of those wonders, and all of us being instruments of God, we begin to work for one another. And we begin to convert and learn about God and value God, give thanks to him. We praise him. We exalt him. And along the way, we are happy. We're healed. God lives with us. And one day we will have eternal life. That is the ministry, the beautiful ministry 
of good tidings, the ministry of the new covenant of salvation and what God has done using men. Because there are people who say, well, how is it possible that God can use a man or a woman and they're so sinful? How could he use them? How could he use them to prophesy? Well, God uses them because first he transforms them. It says that they were transformed in that same image from glory to glory, that person. So now they are worthy of the Holy Spirit being in that person, uses their tongue, uses their hands, uses all of their body, all of their being, the way that they stare and gaze so that they win over souls for God. There is the Holy Spirit doing the work. He is the one doing the work, but using his instruments, using human beings. That is what God has done. And so thanks be to the Lord that we being so vile, so such sinners and evil, yet God has us here in his presence. He is cleansing us. He is purifying us. He is perfecting us. He is transforming us from glory to glory. Blessed is the Lord to do his beautiful work of evangelizing and that all the world may know that God exists and that he deserves the honor, glory, and praise and that we give him thanks because the miracles are done by him. So God is mighty. And this, this is the ministry, the beautiful ministry that we have this ministry as we have received mercy. We do not lose heart. Verse two, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So the change of life that the apostle Paul experiences here is it's that they had already left behind the evil ways that they had followed in the world. Those hidden things of shame, sin, and it says here, no longer handling the word of God deceitfully. And before that word of God had been twisted for thousands of years until finally the Lord manifests himself, his word had been twisted and misinterpreted by other traditions. It had been put to sh put or had been uh, overshadowed. And so the manifestation of God, the manifestation of God's truth, it says, is what is now in the conscience of all of those who will believe in the Lord. And so that manifestation of God, that truth of God has finally come to the hearts of men and women who truly prepare themselves to follow God's path. And this is what verse two is saying. Now in verse three, but even if our gospel is veiled, so he says now, if we do not preach, if we do not open our mouths and make this known, well, then it is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. So those who do not believe, those who do not want to accept this, well, then the gospel of God will continue to be veiled. But those who have opened their hearts, set their hearts for God, well, the gospel then is discovered. It is revealed. It must be taught. It must be preached and proclaimed out loud. Now, verse number four, whose minds the God of this age. So our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. And it says perishing whose minds the God of this age, meaning the devil, the devil is the God of this age or of this world, it says that the God of this age has blinded, has blinded those who are not believing. And this was in reference to the devil. And it says here, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Verse number four is how sad it is for, the, for it to say that in this time, the God of this age, referring to the devil, has blinded. So the devil has placed blindness in the understanding of those who do not believe, those who are rebellious and stubborn, so that the light of the gospel, the light of God, of the glory of Christ, and Christ, who is the image of God, it said that Christ is the image of God. But to those unbelievers, this enemy has placed a veil, has blinded them, and they do not understand. They do not comprehend. This is why they do not accept it. This is why they do not believe. 
And who is the one losing? Well, God is not losing. We human beings, the unbelievers, those foolish ones, they are the ones losing for they let themselves be deceived by that enemy. Verse five, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your bond servants for Jesus sake. So the apostle says, well, we we're not preaching ourselves. We are preaching Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. And we are simply those bond servants, servants of God. We are those instruments God is using for the evangelical work. Now in verse number six, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. And this is in reference to our Lord Jesus Christ here, because in Genesis chapter one, I believe in verse two or three, where it says that God created light. He said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, this is that light that the apostle Paul is speaking of here in verse six, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So our Lord Jesus Christ is always present for he is the image of God. He is the way or it is the way that God wanted it to be for this new covenant to then be formed or for this new covenant to be born, a new method of salvation. God himself made himself flesh. He took flesh, made himself into an ordinary man to be able to live among men. That is what God did. He is powerful. He is mighty. He can do that. He was able to do that. Now, why do human beings take away that merit from God and say, no, God did not do that. He was incapable of doing that. That's not possible to do. Well, yes, for men, for human beings, it is impossible to do these things. But for God, it is not. It was not impossible for God, for him to become a human being and dwell on earth and to give himself a name, Jesus of Nazareth. That's it. So Jesus is the image of God. Verse number six, I'm going to read it again. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts so he being that light has shown in our hearts, in the hearts of those who the apostle Paul was preaching to in that time, and also the hearts of all of us today, God has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face, all based here on the face of Jesus Christ. So God is that powerful being that can do all things and became a man, became a human being because he wanted to test mankind and to place something difficult upon them and how hard it is for human beings to believe that God came here on earth as a human being and dwelled on earth and he was hungry and he got tired and he slept because he behaved as a human being and how hard it is for human beings to accept and believe these things. But God did that to test those who are unfaithful, rebellious, and arrogant, to test those who are unbelieving. But God also did that to bless those who have a willing heart for him. Blessed is the Lord. And we want we want to have a prepared heart for God. We want to believe the Lord and say, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I believe that you are able to do all of these things because you are the powerful God. And what thing in the universe is it too hard for you to renew and transform, to create or to remove and erase it? You can do it all. You are mighty. You are the eternal God. You are the God that rules the universe. That's it. And so this says in verse seven, it says, but we, the apostle says, but we have this treasure. We have this treasure. What treasure? And it's in earthen vessels, it says. In verse six, it says that God, he said, let there be light. And there the light appeared in that light. It shined in hearts. It gave light of the knowledge 
of the glory of God. It gave light to all of those who believed in God because it was God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And it was preached to many beings and those who heard, they believed just like we today, we are believing, we believe in him. And so this is a treasure this treasure, this light, this Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ who is the image of God, who is there, and that God had set in place there for salvation, to save, to give eternal life, that has become a great treasure. In verse 7, it says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And what are those earthen vessels? Well, it is us. We, who in our hearts, we have already accepted the God of glory. We have accepted that Jesus Christ is the image of God. We have accepted that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He is God himself. And it is who God sent to the world to become a man, an ordinary man, and to be among people. And we believe in that, in that treasure. And that is the new method. That is that great ministry that God has given for us. Preaching, preaching our Lord of glory, the Lord who was crucified and who resurrected, who shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And the, those who believe and follow him and keep his commandments word for word will have eternal life. That is the great treasure God has given us. And it says in verse number seven, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, and it is our hearts that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. It says that the excellence of the power is of God and not of us. And so when a brother, he just shared an experience that someone had a dream. Someone had a dream with Maria Luisa. Now, does Maria Luisa, as a human, does she have the power to make someone have a dream with Maria Luisa? Well, I don't have power. I don't have the power to have anyone make, or I don't have the power to have someone have a dream with me, but it is God who does it. God allowed someone to have a dream with Maria Luisa because if they maybe have them dream with someone they don't understand, they won't understand the dream. But he gave them a dream with someone he knew so that they could obey treasure this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of god and not of us it is god he is the powerful one he is the one who does everything in everyone he is everything in us he is the one who gives dreams and visions and prophecy he is the one who speaks he is the one who gives and who takes he is the one who does everything we simply are his servants we are his ministers or we are his workers. We are, what, what are we? We are servants of God. We work in his vineyard. That is what we are. Verse eight, we are hard pressed. So it says we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. So the apostle is saying, well, as human beings, we have tribulation. We are persecuted. We receive threats. People want to take our life. They're going to imprison us. But we're not worried because we believe and we trust that God will help us. He will help us from all of those things. It says perplexed, but not in despair. Yes, sometimes we are anxious about things. We say, well, what do we do now? We've been locked up. Where do we leave? How do we escape from this? But we're not despaired because God will be with me. God will give me a way out. He will give me victory. Verse nine, persecuted, but not forsaken. Yes, persecuted. We will always be persecuted all the time because our enemy will place envy, wrath, and anger with those who are blind and deaf to God's word. He will use them. The enemy uses his human instruments as well to go against the children of God, to harm them, hurt them in one way or another with slander or insults or illnesses or accidents, whatever it may be, the enemy is there. He is against the children of God. And so it says persecuted, but not forsaken. God will not forsake us. Struck down, but not destroyed. Yes. And so the slander, the insults come and they say, well, this is the most evil person in existence. And when they go and look for a proof, there isn't any. 
But God is the one who stands up for us. God brings us up. He lifts us up. God places us on high. Glory to God. We have suffered. And sometimes we suffer moments of tribulation. And every time we will suffer those things, maybe because we're not exempt to those things, we will always be persecuted by that enemy. But God will always be with us. He will give us victory. In verse number 10, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. So the apostle, he is saying that he and all of his companions, they've had suffering and tribulation, but there is more joy in the heart and the satisfaction of having God in the heart that is greater and is and far more beautiful than all the persecution or the evil that the enemy may do against us. And he says, always caring about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So they, in that time, they were more persecuted than any of us today. Today, we have maybe persecutions from the enemy with sin. He places so much sin today in the lives of brothers and sisters, the believers. He places sin because with technology nowadays and all of this advanced technology, there are so many things that produce pleasure to the flesh. And so people fall. The brothers and the sisters, they are weakened, they lose heart, and they fall into the devil's trap. But here the apostle in that time, they were persecuted because they were going to be taken and be stoned. They were going to be imprisoned and they were going to be hung. And here in verse 12, so then death is working in us, but life in you. So he's saying we, the preachers, those who serve God and we're preaching his word. Well, death is what surrounds us. But you, what you have now is eternal life because that is what we are preaching to you. The good tidings of salvation and you are on your way to eternal life. But we, as we are the preachers, well, we're persecuted. That is what the Apostle Paul was saying to them in other words. Verse 13, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. So he says that the Lord was who convinced them they believed and now they are speaking they are preaching and so they too submit themselves to the consequences of it and we today we can say the same we say lord we've believed and we since we have believed now we are speaking and now we are preaching preaching your name your message the good tidings preaching the wonderful work of the holy spirit and then the enemy comes and attacks us in many different ways. But Lord, you are with us and you will help us. You will always help us because you have promised it. Thanks be to the Lord. That is what we do today as well. Now, verse 14, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus, who is our father, will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through many, through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, so this outward man perishes. What is our outward man? Our flesh, our body. Now, unfortunately, it does wear out until we reach our old age. And then, of course, we go to sleep. To sleep. Those who go to sleep, when you die in the Lord, you sleep to then resurrect on that latter day. But this body, of course, it does wear out and it perishes. But do you know what never perishes? Our inner, inward man. And it says here, verse 16. And therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man, meaning our physical bodies, is perishing, yet the inward man, meaning our spirit, accompanied with our conscience and accompanied with that inward man, that is the inward man, 
It says, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Glory to God. So the spirit never grows old. He is renewed. He attains more knowledge. He acquires more maturity and more experience and learns more, knows more, teaches more, has conviction, has trust in the Lord. And there is nothing that causes them to waver or to be discouraged or to lose heart because they grow day by day in that marvelous knowledge of the doctrine and of God's word. This is what we call spiritual maturity. Maturity. So the spirit matures and grows and is renewed. Of course, yes, the spirit is afflicted in seeing that the flesh where he is dwelling, that body is, of course, perishing. But we must do the work and do all things up to our capability. And this is why it says, seek the Lord while he can be sought. While we are able to do the work, while we're able to work in that vineyard of God, then we should then make the effort and work and do that work with that knowledge and with the maturity that God has given us with the doctrine to teach all and teach people and to always be teaching people, correcting people. Do not tolerate people. Do not be lenient or, or tolerant, permissive with people. And if they are all of the, in the church, in your family, if they are in the church and they are sinning, correct them. Do, say to them, do not do that. God is not pleased with that. Look, God will forsake you. He will leave you in the hands of the devil and the devil will do very bad things to you. Place illnesses and many evil things. Correct yourself. Turn away. Repent. Live a holy life. Live an upright life. You must teach. You must correct you should not let just the preacher teach because he is not someone who knows people's lives. So you, you too need to become those people to speak, to pray for one another, to teach and correct one another and not be permissive of sin. Now, of course, there are people who say, well, I live with people who are not converted. They're not in the church. I'm the only one who goes to church. Well, in that case, you can't do anything in your home, in your household. Those people are not a part of the church. So you need to be very careful and wise. So you can't truly go and admonish them or correct their sin. You can't do that. You can't. So be wise. You correct only those who go to church. Those who say they are converted to God, they are those who you must teach. Now, in verse number 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, we know that the apostle faced tribula his tribulations and shared his tribulations with them. Verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we, we look at the Lord's promises. We look at his doctrine, his word, and what God has in store for us for the future. That is the most important thing. Now in, verse, in chapter five, the topic continues, but for today, I think we're going to stop here. Or in verse one, it says, for if we know that if our earthly house, what is our earthly house? Our physical body. Our body is that earthly house. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, blessed and praises the name of the Lord. And if you want to know and you want to learn something more concerning this building, this house that God has for us in the heavens, well, read Revelation. Read in Revelation for there it speaks of that vision God gave John showing him in the future that temple, that great city of Jerusalem, that great city, that Zion spiritually with that tabernacle 
or that house, which is the Lord himself. And the streets are of gold. Everything is of gold and of precious stones. That great city, that place that God has for us there. And I hope that we are all there one day with the Lord. And this is why make an effort. This is why fight, fight to attain that eternal blessing, that blessing. Read in Revelation, there you will find of that temple, that new temple that God will form where he speaks of a new heaven, a new earth. And so that is what God has in store for the future for his chosen ones, for those who submit to God's word, to obey God's word and to turn away from sin. Because there are many people who do not want to turn away from sin. And we know, we know there are many evil spirits. There is witchcraft and sorcery that are cast against people constantly. And so those spirits, they come onto people and those spirits do not allow them to, to move or to think or to reason and to make decisions does not allow them to truly coordinate their thoughts. And this is true. And for that, there is laying on of hands and they're also going to church asking for laying on of hands so that the Lord may deliver and remove these spirits, all of this witchcraft. And when you feel free in your heart, you reflect, you analyze your situation, and you acknowledge before God your weaknesses, your sins, your errors. And you say to God, Lord, I'm this, I'm that, and I can't abandon this on my own. Please help me, Lord, because if you do not help me, then what can I do? This is the fight. This is the fight so that we are able to attain such great blessings that God has for us in the future. So we must fight against these evil spirits that are around us, that persecute us and torment us. And many are living with people. This is why in households, there are many households that maybe where the husband, he is filled with evil spirits and the wife also has evil spirits or the children. And so there are a lot of misunderstandings. No one gets along and everyone has maybe a desire to take their life. Or maybe he, he starts to do bad things. He's unfaithful and does all sorts of things. And she too. So there is no peace. And if they go to church, they don't convert. They don't truly dedicate themselves wholeheartedly to God so that God may deliver them. But they just go to church and say, okay, I'm just going to go to see what they prophesy. They use it as divination because there are people who think that prophecy is divination. And this is incorrect. God is not pleased with that. God knows the hearts of each person. And if you believe that prophecy is divination, well, then it's a complete failure because it'll come in here and leave the other way. It will have no effect upon you because God truly is the one who acts in the hearts of people according to their heart and their mindset. And so you need to value and respect God, love God and please God. And so turn away. Turn away from what is evil. Turn away from sin. You, believer, you as a believer who have been in the church for quite some time, for you to truly live an upright life before God. And if you feel that you are disturbed by evil spirits, then go to church, ask for laying on of hands, speak to the pastor and ask him, lay hands on me because I have spirits. I have many sinful tendencies, evil tendencies. I make my family suffer. I can't free myself. I don't know what to do. Pray for me. Help me because I can't alone. And that is what you need to do. We must fight. We must fight, but we also must be very sincere because God needs to be given that first place. And God is powerful, but he too, he wants us to acknowledge things, our mistakes, and to desire that change. So when someone asked the Lord and asked to be healed, and the Lord, he, may, he asked him a question. He said, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be free? He said, yes, Lord, I want to. So the Lord said, okay, since you want it, the miracle is granted to you. But if a person says, oh, no, Lord, I don't want to. I don't want it. But this person answered and said, yes, I want it. Help me, change me, cleanse me. That's it. That's what we need to do. And so those who are newcomers and our first time guests, don't worry. God 
is going to keep you here in his the palm of his hand because you are n- newborn babies and you he takes good care of you. He is very gentle, but those who have been in the church for quite some time and have gotten to know the Lord, he wants to straighten our paths. And thanks to God, he does straighten our paths because this is important for our spiritual growth. And so the honor and the glory be for our God. Let us now pray to God. Blessed Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this reflection. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you, Lord, because the experiences of the Apostle Paul and everything that he learned from you, they have been so useful to us and will be useful to all future generations. And all of the persecution that he faced, well, we too are persecuted in a different way now today, but we are persecuted. But just as the Apostle Paul triumphed in life, He was victorious because you were with him and you were with them. You protected them. And so you are the same with us today. It is the same way that you manifest yourself and we want to please you. And we want to do your will, Lord, to love you. And we want to speak to people and teach people that you live, that you are real, that you exist, that you are a mighty God. And that you are love for all of those who open and set their hearts to you. Just as your word says, you will be merciful with the mercy, or the merciful. We know this, Lord. We know this, Holy Father. But you too are consuming fire with all those who are arrogant and stubborn and unbelieving. But as we, we are not that way, Lord. We want to have a humble, modest heart so that we are able to accept your orders, your commands and your word to do your will and to obey you in all things. And to always be attentive to pleasing you in all things, Lord, help us, help us with this grace so that we are able to overcome and overcome our own selves and attain those marvelous blessings and attain those great triumphs and rewards that you have for all those who believe in you. Lord, thank you. Thank you how beautiful it is, Lord, when we read Psalms and there we find all the promises and all the blessings and everything that you have for human beings, for people who have that understanding and those who maybe lack that understanding, Lord, you will give it to them because you look at the heart. You look at a humble and modest heart Thank you, my God. Father, I ask you in this moment, look at how many people are here before me and how many people are listening. And look at all of the hearts. Observe the hearts of all and look at their affliction and all of their needs. Look at their petitions and their desires and grant them those desires and petitions and help them deliver, Lord, and transform them from glory to glory. And also heal, heal all those who suffer from different diseases, any disease, Lord, any disease as incurable as a disease may be, well, there is nothing impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. There are many incurable diseases and you have healed them. You've taken them away. I ask, Lord, that you stretch out your healing hand as that divine physician that you are and that you deliver all those who are bound by witchcraft and sorcery. Remove all demons, all evil spirits, all curses and give power to your children, to your followers, your servants and give them power to cast out demons, give them power to remove curses and witchcraft, give them power to remove evil spirits, give them power so that when they lay on hands, people are delivered and people may love you and follow you and praise you with all of their heart because you deserve it, Father. Thank you, Father. In the glorious name of Jesus Christ, we ask that you bless all Bless all.
and look at all those who suffer and look at the marriages and the households who are suffering, those who are maybe on a path of divorce and separation, maybe husbands who are unfaithful, wives who are unfaithful, children maybe who are succumbed to drug addiction, those who are in prison and people's relatives who go to church, all those who maybe are deprived from their freedom, all of them, Lord, I ask that you have mercy, that you stretch out your hand and that you deliver and free them from there so that they may get to know your path, your truth, and your love. Thank you, Father. In the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, amen. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Chorus number 89. Gloria. His glory, the Su gloria covered. cubrió los cielos. Y la tierra se llenó de su alabanza. Su gloria cubrió los cielos. Y la tierra se llenó de su alabanza. Y el Glory to our God. May God bless you greatly. I send you many hugs and kisses for all the children. And then until next time, thank you, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm.